What is growing on gardeners? It is Sunday, February 20th, and it is a chilly but really nice and clear spring day here on the southeastern coast of North Carolina. Today, we're going to talk all about tomatoes. However, you will be able to apply these principles to pretty much every flowering and fruiting vegetable out there. We're going to discuss the differences between open pollinated, heirloom, hybrid, and GMO tomatoes, and I'm also going to tell you why I just don't bother growing many heirloom tomatoes anymore. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing and hitting the bell to receive new video notifications and check out our Amazon storefront and spread shop in the video description for a list of the gardening products I use and awesome custom designed apparel and other gear. Your support is greatly appreciated. We're going to begin this video with a controversial statement. Heirloom tomatoes are overrated. Yes, as a class, a category, I think heirloom tomatoes are extremely overrated and I'm going to tell you exactly why. All an heirloom tomato is, is an open pollinated tomato variety that has been saved and you can trace that lineage back for at least 50 years. That's all it is. It's just an age qualifier. So in order to understand what that means, you have to understand what an open pollinated tomato is. Open pollination is the most common way that tomatoes are fertilized or pollinated in nature. Now a tomato flower that you can see right here, they have both the male and the female parts inside that same flower. So a tomato flower has the ability to pollinate itself. Most tomato flowers are pollinated simply by wind. The wind comes and it moves that tomato flower around and it vibrates it and then it mixes that male pollen all over the female pollen inside this uh, flower right here. So the mother and the father are the same plant and when that happens that means when you get this fruit that was wind pollinated all of the seeds in that plant will grow to be a genetically identical clone to the parent plant and that's because the mother and the father are the same so the offspring are all going to be clones or they're going to be so incredibly genetically similar that you're not really going to notice a difference that's really how it happens in nature varieties can creep a little bit away over many decades and decades but they're generally considered stable now i just use that word stable in order to have an open pollinated variety you need to stabilize that variety it has to be stable so what does that mean well in order to understand how to stabilize a tomato you have to understand what a hybrid is first over the years of having this channel I have learned that there is major confusion between what a hybrid is and what a GMO is they have absolutely nothing in common hybridization of these tomato plants is the most natural way that mother nature spreads genetic diversity and creates different varieties when you see a hybrid tomato all it means is it is a natural effect of cross-pollination so if I take two genetically different tomato varieties and they're each flowering and they each have flowers on them and a bee migrates from the flower on this plant to the flower on this plant you will get cross-pollination because the pollen from this plant will get inside the flower of this plant so after this tomato flower becomes cross-pollinated if you isolate that flower and you grow out that fruit that fruit that will form every single seed inside that fruit will be genetically unique because they will have a different mother and father. So just like human beings, if you had 10 different children, uh, they would all be genetically different where they would be some mix of mom and some mix of dad. That's how every single individual uh, tomato seed will grow in that saved fruit. So if you save 50 seeds from there and you grow all 50 out, you will get 50 genetically different uh, tomatoes, all different varieties, where there will be some mix of the genes between the mother and the father. Every single one of those 50 seeds that you grow out will be F1 hybrids, F1 uh, first generation hybrids. And that is all a hybrid plant is. It's just a cross between a mom and a dad. And with that, you get a blend of both of the fruits and you get increased genetic diversity open pollination or self-pollination and hybridization or cross-pollination are both natural processes. GMOs or genetically modified organisms are entirely different. They are done in a lab and this is how that works. So let's say I want to make a blue tomato 
and I noticed that there is a fish swimming around in the ocean that has blue scales. And I want to guarantee my tomatoes are going to be blue. What I would do is I would go into a laboratory and I would extract that blue gene from the fish and I would insert that gene into the DNA or lineage of a tomato. And then the product I would get would be a blue tomato using the blue coloring from the genetics of a fish. Or let's say I want to make a cold hardy tomato. As we all know, uh, tomatoes are frost tender. Frost and freeze will kill them. Let's say I want to give the tomato plants the ability to withstand freeze like, say, a kale plant. I could take genetics from a kale plant that gives them those special characteristics to survive frost and freeze and insert those, those genetic markers inside uh, the tomato lineage inside the tomato's DNA in a lab. And maybe I could create some kind of tomato plant through trial and error inserting those genes that can now tolerate frost and freeze. That is GMO. It is an entirely man-made process alien to mother nature. Now that's not to say GMOs are bad per se. If we understood exactly what we were doing and we had the process down, maybe one day we could be growing tomatoes all year round in Alaska and we can solve the world food crisis. There's some potential there. However, right now we don't really know what we're doing. And that's why I try to stay away from GMOs because we don't know the long-term health implications. Maybe we are creating the next food security boom and we're all going to be great because of it. Or maybe we will create the next invasive species that will take over the planet and cause mass devastation. Or maybe the plants, there's some health implications to eating them long-term. We just don't know, so I personally care to avoid them wherever I can. Now hopefully you understand that a hybrid and a GMO have absolutely nothing in common. One is Mother Nature's way of creating genetic diversity and new varieties and perpetuating the species. The other one is human beings trying to play God and play their own Mother Nature. Very, very different things. So now that you understand how open pollination or self-pollination works and how hybridization or cross-pollination works, how do you stabilize a variety? Well, it goes like this. Let's say I want to create a new tomato variety. I want a large heirloom beefsteak, but I also want it to be variegated and striped. So maybe I will take an heirloom beefsteak with great flavor like yellow brandy wine, and I'll cross it with some really good tasting striped tomato. And using cross pollination, I will manually control the cross with a blush brush, and I'll move the pollen between the flowers of the two. Then that first year, I will save all of the seeds from those tomatoes, and I will grow out 50 different tomato plants. Every single plant that grows will be an F1 or first generation hybrid. And every single one of those 50 plants will be that hybrid cross, but they will be genetically unique and be slightly different and vary in their fruit quality. So after I grow out all 50 plants, I will allow them to fruit and then I will observe all the fruit. And then I will choose the best tomato out, out of all of them. The biggest one or the best tasting one or the best looking one, whatever the traits that I want are. Then from that one tomato that I deem to be the best, I will save the seeds from that tomato and then I will plant them out again. And I will wind up with a whole bunch of F2 hybrids. That's because those seeds are not yet stable. You need about seven or eight generations of planting out that seed without cross-pollination for them to become a stable cross. So at this stage, all of the plants that I'm growing from the seed, I need to isolate them all to make sure there's no cross-pollination because I need them to stabilize over seven to eight different generations of planting out however many seeds I want, and every time saving my favorite fruit. And after about seven to eight generations, I will wind up with a stabilized variety that every single time they open pollinate and they self-pollinate, they will grow out to be almost genetically identical to the parent. And that will then be a stabilized open pollinated variety. And then if I keep saving that seed for 50 years, it will then become an heirloom variety. And that's all that these things are. They're just stabilized varieties that we save for 50 years or more. Now the only reason why that heirloom varieties tend to taste good is this. Because 
if a variety of tomato is worthy of being saved for at least 50 years to maintain that lineage, it's probably for a good reason. It's probably because it's really good tasting or there's something unique or really cool about it. That's the only reason why heirloom tomatoes tend to have that reputation to be good flavor. If they didn't taste good, you wouldn't save them for that long. That's it. So now I want to tell you why I don't grow heirloom tomatoes much at all anymore. I live on the immediate southeastern coast of North Carolina, and here in the coastal southeast, we get a lot of rain, a lot of humidity, and a lot of heat, and a lot of pest pressure in the summer. So as a result, tomato disease pressure in my climate is very high. And heirloom tomatoes, generally speaking, have very poor production and very poor disease resistance as a result of the stabilization process. Allow me to explain. Now I just told you how tomatoes are stabilized. For seven or eight years, gardeners are growing out these varieties, trying to stabilize them, and every single time they're picking the best fruit. However, what they are defining as the best fruit is always about flavor and looks. It is never about disease resistance. Because you keep inbreeding that plant for seven or eight generations, not allowing them to naturally cross, and you're only saving the best tasting or the best looking fruits, or fruits that have certain visual uh, characteristics or size characteristics, you are actually breeding out the genetic diversity over time. You're breeding out the ability for that plant to fight off disease. You are breeding out that plant's ability to set massive amounts of fruit. So whereas the natural genetic diversity that comes with cross-pollination makes plants tougher and more disease resistant and more prolific because that is the goal of mother nature to spread seed and to spread a more disease resistant hardier crop you as a human being breeding these seeds for certain taste characteristics actually flies in the face of nature so you're in your quest to get the best tasting fruit possible you're actually breeding a weaker plant that wants to produce less now, every now and again, you'll come up with an open pollinated or a hybrid variety that is also pretty disease resistant, that tastes pretty good as well. There's a few examples of that, like Arkansas Traveler or German Johnson, that uh, have pretty decent flavor, that handle disease pretty well, but they are the exception, not the rule. This process basically, naturally, breeds out genetic diversity that makes tomatoes strong and productive. And it's for this reason that I now mostly grow F1 hybrids. Now that I've lived here on the southeastern coast of North Carolina for about five years, and in that time, I've probably grown at least 100 different varieties of tomatoes, I've found that overwhelmingly the best producers or the best overall or well-rounded plants are the F1 hybrids of tomatoes that try to approximate heirlooms. That's when they take an heirloom variety, most commonly like a Brandywine or a Cherokee Purple or something else like that, that tastes great but has poor yields and poor disease resistance. Then they cross it with another pretty good tasting tomato that may not be as good but is much more disease resistant. They're coming out with these varieties that now taste and look almost exactly like the heirlooms, but they have the disease resistance of a hybrid thanks to the genetic diversity. Right now, some of my favorite varieties of tomatoes are the, the F1 hybrids that try to approximate an heirloom parent. I've been having a lot of success with them. So like the Chef's Choice hybrid line of tomatoes, as well as Big Brandy and Brandy Boy, and also very well adapted uh, hybrids like uh, Big Beef or Bella Rosa or Celebrity that have been around for a long time that really are perfect looking tomatoes that taste great. Those are the tomatoes that I really recommend that most growers grow because they perform so much better than the heirlooms, but you still get the great size, you get the great taste. They even mostly look the same. So they're a great no compromise way of getting all of the benefits of an heirloom tomato with none of the struggles because you get so much more productivity and so much more disease resistance. The only downside to growing the F1 hybrids is you can't save the seed and have them grow back true to type. So if you want them to, to grow correctly every single year, 
you're going to have to buy the seed when you run out. Tomato seed usually stays good for about two, three, maybe four years if you store it in a cool, dry place. After that, you're going to have to go out and buy more. So I just wanted to take this time and explain all of these concepts and what I've learned over the years and why I choose to do what I choose to do. And I hope that this information can be very valuable to you as well and hopefully put you in some sort of direction if you're not quite sure what to grow or why to grow what you're growing. So I know this video was a little bit rambling and not very organized, but I thought it would be valuable and I hope you did find it interesting and entertaining. If you did like it, please make sure to hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring that notification bell so you can be notified when I release more videos like these. If you're curious about any of the products that I use, they are all linked down below in the video description in my Amazon storefront. While you're there, check out my Spreadshop link for custom made merch if you want to support the channel. Thank you all so much for watching and I hope to see all of you again on the next video. We've been working on Dale's leash reactivity by every single time we're walking and a, a dog will bark at him. If he doesn't react, we give him a treat. Well, the thing is now, every time I tell him he's good, he thinks he's going to get one. Watch. Hey, Dale, you're being a very good boy. Oh, come on. Now you think you're going to get something just because I said you were good? Well, you are right. These are freeze-dried liver treats. Dale, be very gentle. Gentle. Good boy. Good boy. That was good, Dale.